All right, they're coming on slowly, so uh, I'll introduce them slowly. Can you sit well, then, colleague. Okay. Well, first of all, welcome. If you've just managed to squeeze into this room, then welcome to the Crypto Investor Show 2018. If you've already been here for a while, then you'll already know everything about blockchain chain. So I'll skip all that stuff, all the technical bits, and get on to what we're talking about here today. So basically, we're looking at the different ways that people can get a piece of the action, in effect, get in on things. And we've got a number of speakers who are going to be sitting on my panel who are from different areas and are able to advise, hopefully, on the different ways that people can get involved and, crucially, the different ways that people can make money out of it. Because, I've got to be honest here, that's kind of my angle. My name's Glenn Goodman. I'm a former ITV business correspondent, and I gave up being an ITV business correspondent because I was also, in my spare time, a trader in stocks and futures, and I wanted to concentrate on that full time, so gave it all up, gave up the TV, and concentrated on that. And then, of course, crypto came along. And for someone who's been trading now for more than 15 years, that was pretty much a godsend because crypto, I find, is wonderful to trade. If you've ever traded currencies or stocks or futures, trading on cryptocurrency exchanges has, in the past few years, been insanely profitable. And we're not just talking about Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of those obvious ones, but about many, many dozens of other cryptos that I've traded in and invested in too. So, um, uh, just a little bit more of my background, I got a Facebook page going. I called it the Shares Guy. I started making videos talking about crypto trading and that kind of thing. And of course, like all things crypto, last year it went crazy. So I got up to a quarter of a million followers. And now I've just got a publishing deal to write the first uh, major hardback book about how to trade cryptocurrency. So watch out for that. I don't know what it's going to be called yet. Probably how to trade cryptocurrency. Seems to be a popular title. I don't know. Maybe something a bit more creative if I can think of something. I wanted to call it the crypto maze, like the crystal maze, you know, but no, no, you see, the reaction is muted. No, all right, I'll stick to how to trade cryptocurrencies and does what it says on the tin. All right, anyway, hooray, we have our panel all here with us. Hello, panel. Could you squidge up a bit so I can sit in the middle? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Not, not, you know, not because I think I'm more important or anything, just, you know, it's just for logistics reasons. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I'm going to introduce David Cheatham, who you can see just there, the man in the suit and tie. Why is he wearing a suit and tie? Because he works for a trading platform. It's XTB. It's one of the bigger ones. You might have already heard of it. They provide CFDs, contracts for difference, which basically allow you to bet on the price movements in cryptocurrencies rather than actually <coughs> buying the cryptocurrencies themselves. So in a sense, it's safer. Well, they are regulated in the UK, so in that sense, it's safer. So you're in less danger of losing your money. You can't be hacked and somebody steal your cryptocurrencies. You don't have to keep your cryptocurrencies on a piece of hardware because you don't actually own them. You're just betting on the movements in the prices, either up or indeed down, which could have been quite profitable for some people in the recent past for obvious reasons. So he'll tell you more about that when I ask him some questions. Also with us, we have George McDonough, who is the CEO of KR1. You might have seen the KR1 stage, uh, which uh, I've been hosting over round the back. Go there later on. I'm going to be talking about the nuts and bolts of crypto investing at around about 2.40, 3 o'clock. I don't know. Check the schedule. Somewhere around that time, I'm going to be looking at the very nuts and bolts of how to trade in crypto. Uh, and George, whose stage that is, runs one of the first ever crypto funds, uh, focuses on the token economy, seed funding, early stage blockchain projects and ICOs. And this is actually a tradable fund. So if you have stocks and shares, if you've got you know, just a normal uh, stock brokerage account in the UK, you can actually buy shares in his fund, which then tracks the prices of various early stage cryptos uh, that he has invested in. Also, we have Gilad Wolcevich, who is sitting over there, who is from Credium. And Credium ha is basically focused on, let me get this right, <laughs> the, the credit economy 
particularly for smaller firms, building some infrastructure that is based on blockchain that smaller firms can use to buy and sell credit-related products. So basically debt, buying and selling debt. Is that right? Yeah, except for we're not actually focused on smaller firms. We're actually talking to some of the biggest qualified institutional buyers in the US. And we're particularly driving efficiencies to the secondary credit platforms. So uh, currently in the US alone, there's about $18 trillion of outstanding uh, debt that is trading hands based on technologies and processes of about 30 or 50 years ago. Literally loan tapes, CS CSV files, fax machines, analysts, a lot of intermediaries in the middle. And we're bu building a, a shared uh, credit ledger, allowing instantaneous uh, exchanges of credit assets. OK, well, there you have it. And sorry to say you only deal with small. Oh, no problem. No. <laughs> we're, we're open for everyone. We're dealing with small and, and big as one. Big. Well, we're creating a standard, basically. Yeah. OK. We'll find out more about that a little bit later on. Um, we've still got more. We've got so many speakers. Josh Redette, Easy Crypto Hunter. Easy Crypto Hunter. This guy will help you mine your cryptocurrencies if you're into that kind of thing. I've never actually mined myself, though I met a guy, a kind of, he looked homeless, to be honest, this guy <laughs> at a, uh, a blockchain conference in Amsterdam just a few weeks ago. He's like a big lumbering guy who's like, oh. And uh, I said, well, what are you doing here then, you know, as we're chatting? And he's like, oh, I just like go to conferences. Well, what are you involved in? No, nothing really. It was like, well, why are you here? And his friend who ran a big blockchain company just went, he was mining Bitcoin when it was like three cents. <laughs> like, well, how much Bitcoin did you mine? Like a, a ton, a ton of Bitcoin. <laughs> that's, so that's it. Now he just like doesn't wash his clothes, wanders about the world going to conferences. <laughs> Never has to do anything again. So. Anyway, Josh will sell you the equipment that probably won't give you that lifestyle because we've missed Maybe. that particular boat. But it might give Ask you... in five years. All right. In five years. Yeah. There are other cryptos, obviously. And some of them might go to the moon, too. So Josh will help you with that. And uh, last but not least, it's Shane Kehoe from SVK Crypto. And you're going to talk to us about, well, a number of different things, but I'm particularly interested in your crowd that you have, putting together groups of people to look at ICOs and invest and that kind of thing. Am I right? Sort of. OK, well, <laughs> you'll go into it in more detail later. Ooh, that was awkward. OK, so let's take a seat. We're going to go through, first of all, each speaker will find out more about what each of them does and how you can get involved in the kind of area that they're involved in. And after we've done that, then we'll start taking some questions as well. I'll, I'll ask a few questions, and we'll take some other questions, and you can direct them at whoever you want. OK, so let's kick off, I think. <laughs> so as you're looking a little bit. I'm good to go. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> it's George McDonough. And as I said, he's uh, from KR1. And you know, because you kind of run a fund, mm. it's easy for people to get it involved in. They could simply go to the stock exchange, type in KR1, and buy some shares in KR1. And then basically, they'll just be tracking the ICOs and the sort of startup cryptos that you get involved with and that you choose. Why is that a better way of doing it than them actually going onto the ICO's own websites, getting involved in pre-sales, buying up tokens at an early stage, just basically doing it themselves. Why should they sure. do it with you? Well, um, I think it's a, it's a rather opaque technology sometimes. It's hard to know uh, what's happening. It's moving incredibly quickly. Um, there's so many different platforms that are uh, uh, arriving. With uh, When you read the white papers, it's quite difficult to know what areas uh, are worthwhile looking at. Um, and I think that what we do, and we've been doing it since, since the beginning of the token economy, I think we've got the, the longest track record of any crypto fund. Um, and, and so we've been building a strategy whereby we can isolate good projects, uh, isolate good teams, um, work out where they sit in the infrastructure uh, and the wider ecosystem as a whole. And then we uh, seed fund them. We get in very early. We get great allocations, um, and we we help these projects through to their to their token generation events. So, um, 
I completely feel like anyone can do what we do to some degree. Um, you just have to spend a lot of time uh, learning the framework in which to do the, due, the, the required due diligence. Um, and and uh, uh, so I'd say that if you want a shortcut uh, to some degree, uh, we're, we're a very good thing. We're a very good thing to have um, in your in your portfolio. Um, well, can I ask how yeah. much tech savvy do you personally believe that you need in order to invest in ICOs, pre pre sale ICOs, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think you need to be hugely technical. What 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 you need is how do you, you know because. I'm, I'm technical-ish, yeah, but I'm not the world's okay. greatest coder. So when I go to a white sure. paper and you know it's, it's making okay. all kinds of promises, uh, it, it's all it's all about it's all about understanding who to listen to. So my, my advice would be uh, get onto Twitter and find the best developers in the world who are working on this space. Find out who they're following, and and take out all the noise. So to all the all the, the pumping groups, the people who are saying buy this, buy that, take it all out get a list of developers who know what they're talking about and every day just go through and listen to what they're excited about because they're the key they're the wizards who are building this whole thing and 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 by 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 understanding what 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 gets them excited you'll you'll get a, a, a you'll get a sense of which projects are um, fulfilling the needs that they're looking for in terms of scaling deep stack architecture stuff on which other products are going to be built on um, that that would be that would be my advice, um, and by doing that, you'll learn you'll learn all about the space and and, and the important areas uh, uh, that are going to allow this to get to a far wider audience. I, I would agree with George on this point, and it's this is the first time that the investor can actually do an awful lot of research. This is not just for as the IPO market that we saw in the in the late 90s. This is open to everybody, and with that becomes amazing opportunity, not just on, on Twitter, but also looking at Telegram, and also going onto their GitHub and seeing their latest coding and what's being put up in GitHub. And certainly with the ICOs, the proper, the proper most eloquent ICOs that we see that tend to have the best will be very truthful and open source with their GitHub, and they will be updating their coding all the time. This is a very important point that Georges makes, but you can definitely find it if you do the research. Yeah, I, I agree. That's the best advice that I've heard well, in a long time. It's worked for me. Yeah. Um, I'm not a hugely technical guy. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the technology I've been in since the very early days. So my, my whole uh, life in this space has been about uh, uh, keeping close to the people and the technologists who know what's going on and, and supporting them in any way I can. Because very often these guys, these guys want to code. They don't want to raise money. Right? It's the last thing they want to be doing. They just want to be coding. And so KR1 is just there to help them um, fill, fill that gap so that they can, they can build what they need to build. Okay, but Shane um, from SVK Crypto, when you go to, Git, uh, to GitHub, are you, I, I mean, are you well versed personally enough in coding to know what looks good and what doesn't? Well, I mean, there's some very key signs with how often they update their GitHub and also is it open source? So um, I would have, like George, advisors, technical advisors, who we would go to to check that the coding is correct. But usually we're always looking for them to have a prototype. I always get very concerned when, it, when it's just a white paper project. So I'm always looking for a prototype. I'm looking for a team. And I'm not just talking about a normal team. We, we call it an all-star team. The team has had execution previous. They've already, they've already uh, been involved in maybe some of the bigger Facebooks or Amazons or uh, Googles and that they're open source so that they're sharing all, all their coding. And I think that that's always a very, very positive sign. It's one of the key things that we look when we're going to make a, an early stage ICO investment. There have been some, though, recently that are attracting a lot of interest. I'm getting a lot of, um, a lot of inquiries from just ordinary people going, have you heard about this one? Have you heard about this one? And, and usually the ones that they're talking about seem to be quite closed systems. They have men wearing suits. They, they all look very professional and well marketed, but the code is not open source. Well, just to put it into perspective, there was 903 ICOs last year. About Approximately about 42% of those ICOs are trading below ICO price or have no liquidity. We currently are looking at about 100 ICOs. There's a pipeline that I can see for the next quarter. It's got about 450 ICOs as we stand here today. The amount of deals that we are seeing moving into this space, I have, I, when you look at la last year's, uh, raising, which was the first time um, where the ICO 
past venture capital, I think we raised, depending on which site you look at, about four billion in, in, in ICR raises. We're probably going to have 10 times that this year. So there is low barriers to entry with having an ICO, so everyone and his mother wants to have it. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but you have to have ways where you can filter through, as George says, the noise. You have to have a plan. You have to have a tick box. You have to have a process in looking at, at, at the ICO. But um, there are some phenomenal opportunities out there. There are some amazing projects, but I think you really have to do your, your, your due diligence. But it's actually the first time, and coming at it from, from uh, being at a, a hedge fund before I set up SVK and running their IPO book for, for several years and their capital markets product, what I'm really fascinated about the current stage that we're in is the accessibility. And the accessibility to get the chief technical officer or the CEO or the advisory team on the phone to have a deep dive. And it's, it's an amazing situation that we're currently in right now, that people are willing to get on and discuss their project and show you how it works. And I think if anyone wasn't willing to do that, it would be a red flag. But uh, I, I think the premier projects that, that, that SVK and I'm sure some of our other panelists are involved in will be very open with, with their coding as long as they know that you're an investor. Just one other question that while we're on the topic, and I would address this to any of our panelists who happen to know about it, a lot of the kind of projects that are, to me, dodgy, but yet I get the most inquiries about from, from ordinary investors, are the ones that involve network marketing. <laughs> but they just there are so many of them, I instantly think this is a pyramid scheme, it's extremely dodgy. Would, would you all generally agree that if it involves network and affiliate marketing um, in, in kind of stages where you reach different levels, is that always definitely a Ponzi scheme or are there some cases where it could be legitimate? I don't think the best projects need marketing. In fact, the best, pro the best projects are, are not even going to the public sale, which is unfortunate. The best projects are all done private sale and they have no issues raising capital. In fact, I've been on six, six Skype calls this year where the first, quest or the first comment out of uh, the, the project was, we actually don't need your money. We hear that you're nice guys and that you actually do a podcast, a blog, and you put on events and you're in London. So we're really interested to see what else you can bring to the investment. But if it comes down to capital, we're all cool. <laughs> I'd add just one, one point to that, and that would be that there are some projects that have to get their token out for the yeah. system to work. Yeah. So that if you're looking at tokens, um, uh, uh, token projects, if, if, you, if you can take the token out and the system still functions, it's not worth something buying, yeah. not, mm. not worth buying it. If you can replace their token with an Ether token, which millions of people are already using as a, as a, as a, as a payment uh, uh, token, uh, then why buy it? Um, there are certain projects where you can clearly see this wonderful sort of 360 degree use case for the token. Um, and very often they have to do a crowd sale in order for the system to work. Very often it's to do with staking and security. Very often what you're doing is you're designing a token to program the, uh, um, the end user to behave in a certain way. Um, and that's, where this is, this is, that's why this is also powerful. That's these open networks with tokens. Yes, there's the sense that when they get onto the exchange, the token will, will circulate. But yeah. um, I, I'd also say that there are projects like that that are, that are worth looking at. Gilad, I'd ask you, with Credium, you're developing the kind of project that will need, I guess, the patronage of major financial organizations, mm -hmm. uh, big banks potentially. You need them to kind of get on board and look after you. Is there a temptation for a project like yours to try and keep everything as secret as possible because you don't want anyone to copy you, you don't want anyone, anybody to steal a march and get ahead of you. Uh, you know, if, how do you kind of get that balance between yeah. the kind of crypto ethos of open source and the need to kind of look after your product? Sure, yeah, so we, we've been dealing with that uh, a lot. I mean, I've been involved in the space since 2013 and, and it took us quite a long time to understand the value of how to balance uh, a true token economy and uh, let's say a ripple kind of financial institution, financial infrastructure model, and making sure you get the best of both worlds and also drive value from one another. And, and this is something that we've uh, kind of architected and still architecting as we go, but the, I guess the biggest, the closest analogy would be kind of the Red Hat model, if you're familiar with Red Hat. So they develop 
open source protocols because it's for Linux, right? So whatever they develop is open to the public to use. But because they have an enterprise solution, a lot of the enterprises don't want to deal with developing um, Linux tools because it's not their business. So they hire Red Hat to develop all the tools and kind of SLAs on top of that and have a SaaS model in which they can uh, make a better um, open source protocol for the public, but also drive value to their company uh, by building um, the tools around these products. So what we, the way we're approaching it is when we're building kind of, let's say, the lowest level abstraction you can of um, debt exchange or credit exchange and allowing anybody to implement their own exchange on top of that. So in order to drive value to this open source protocol, we're developing this to some, as I said, some of the biggest qualified institutional buyers in the US market and financial institutions where they don't want to deal with developing blockchain tools, but they definitely now gladly for, for, for us, and I think for the economy in general, they understand the value blockchain can drive to their businesses. So they're happy enough to work with us, and, and that's also the way we were able to keep our cap low, because um, we have a whole business model to work with these financial institutions of implementing it. At the same time, this is what I'm talking about, driving value to the open source protocol, that people interact with our smart contract using our token and not a fork of it, for example, and that's why the burden of proof is on us is if we are able to bring the, these um, financial institutions on board and we maintain the system to their highest stringent requirements of regulatory and security frameworks, then anybody using the open source project knows they enjoy the benefit of, uh, of our maintenance of these protocols. And this way you balance out a very interesting uh, model where you incentivize people to use your open source protocol because it has the validation from the financial institutions who might, uh, might not want to um, participate in something that's completely open. And kind of another maybe layer below that is the fact that we've developed the technology to allow financial institutions to publicly publish assets they want to liquidate because you need to expose it if you want to drive liquidity, but proving the, um, the immutability record in time of posting without exposing the data itself. I think this is the core value of what we're developing is giving the staking opportunity for people who want to buy it to uh, actually put some stake if they want to expose the data. And that drives kind of a really nice balance between um, open and closed um, layers of the protocol. Okay, thanks Gilad. Sure. Let's move on to you, David, because you haven't had a chance <laughs> to speak here because you're in a different area and you're in the area that, uh, frankly, I like to focus on personally. It's the area of trading cryptocurrencies that have already done their ICOs, that are already freely tradable. Uh, I venture into the kind of dodgier exchanges that trade hundreds or, or at least dozens of cryptos, but you're at the safer end of things, and that will appeal to a lot of people. So explain why should people take your derivatives contracts, which is what they are, CFDs, betting on the prices of... Uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies either going up or going down. Why should they do that rather than buying the cryptocurrencies themselves? Okay, so first off, when you um, trade or speculate on CFDs, what you're doing, like you say, you're not owning the underlying asset. What you're actually doing is speculating on price movements. Now, when you say that at first, it obviously sounds negative and people don't like the idea of it. They want to own something. They want to have something to, um, well, not to touch, but something to own anyway. But um, when you look into it, and you've seen, obviously, I'm sure everyone here is aware of many um, high-profile frauds and uh, heists that we've had on crypto exchanges, and in using um, uh, FCA-regulated broker, which we are, then I think you have far more transparency and far more uh, trust in your positions and the way you trade uh, through us. Um, I would say also, it doesn't necessarily need to be a case of trading CFDs as opposed to trading on physical exchanges. You can obviously use them in conjunction. Um, for people who've traded for a while or followed the markets, if we look back just before Christmas when we had that major decline, where we saw 30, 35% drops on the day, um, a lot of the big exchanges went offline. People were panicking. I was looking on Twitter and they're saying, I want to get out, I want to get out, I can't sell my product, I can't sell Bitcoin, there's no market for it. What you can always do then is you can always take a short position offsetting that exposure through a CFD with us. We have very reliable and consistent uh, execution. I think execution speed's 80 milliseconds or something like that. 
So if you are, say, for instance, holding a load of Ethereum and you're seeing the price absolutely tank, something very negative's come out, let's say, regards regulation, and you think, I don't want to sell out of this or I'm not able to sell out of this, you can take a position to offset that. So it doesn't need to be a substitute for holding physical cryptocurrencies. It can also be a supplement and an addition to the whole That's thing. a good point. Also, um, I'd be interested to know, there was a period at the end of last year when everybody's gran wanted to buy Bitcoin and were, well, literally, grands were asking me how to buy it. <laughs> yeah. people, who, you know, people who'd literally never been near a trading screen in their life, never bought a stock or a share or anything, were just saying, right, I want to buy some Bitcoin, even though I'm 95 years old. Which is fair enough, but obviously it caused a massive kind of bottleneck and some of your rival exchanges, I know, had to stop allowing people to open contracts on Bitcoin. Um, did XTB have to do that for regulatory reasons? Just say we can't take on any more contracts? Um, no, we didn't have to stop doing it exactly. What we did was we changed our product offering. So the real target, what we're trying to offer to our clients and what to allow them to trade is from a more short-term basis. Mm -hmm. And what we were finding was we were getting people who were looking to come and trade with us. And when you trade on CFDs, you trade on leverage. So what that means is you have greater exposure than what your nominal amount is. Um, so we changed our product offering slightly, which I think reflects more of a trading mentality and more of um, not I'm going to buy this and sit on this for a year, five years, ten years, and it's going to be a retirement fund. More a sort of way, I think this market's going up, I think this market's going down. More of a focus on technical analysis and risk management, limiting your downside. So you stopped and people using that. leverage for a while? We reduced the leverage. We used to offer leverage, I think, of 20 to 1. Now we offer 5 to 1. Right. I mean, 20 to 1 20, is huge. Well, on, on something like Bitcoin, when it was, you know, halving and doubling ripple, and halving. Uh, and ripple doubling. just before Christmas rallied ripple, from yeah. 25 cents to $3.50 in the space for about a week. I so should just explain for people who, people who haven't ever traded on leverage, using leverage before. It's basically a, um, it's a way of investing a, a much smaller amount of money than you might otherwise and being able to borrow a lot of money from the trading platform itself. Say you put in £2,000 uh, and then you borrow, if it's times five leverage, you would borrow £10,000 or 8000 Yeah, it'd be or, five to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> five to one. So you'd borrow so that your entire size of bet was £10,000, including your own 2000 and 8000 that you've borrowed from the exchange. This means that you're buying £10,000 of Bitcoin. So every time the price uh, doubles, then suddenly you've got another £10,000, even though you were only betting with £2,000 of your own money. But likewise, if you're betting at that size, Bitcoin only needs to go down by 20% and you've difficult. lost your entire £2,000. That's it, you're wiped out, your account is gone. So it is really only um, recommended for more experienced traders. That used to be the case, but a lot of the Bitcoin exchanges that are not regulated uh, in the UK in particular, they don't check whether they're, the people who are applying to them have got experience in trading, which you are by law expected yeah, to Yeah, there's fairly stringent um, criteria to prove that you have some knowledge of the products. And we have a big focus on education. We have, in our Canary Wharf offices, we invite clients in all the time uh, with beginners courses where you talk from the very basics about trading. And uh, especially if you trade on leverage, I think leverage is a great tool and it can magnify your profits if you're used correctly. But if you're used incorrectly, like you say, you can magnify your losses. So you need to be careful, you need to be aware of the risks. And one thing, if you are trading on leverage, um, I'd always highly, highly recommend having a stop loss. So a stop loss is basically, if the market goes so far against you, you cut your loss and you get out and you look for another trade. Um, a buy and hold long-term strategy with leverage can be quite damaging, I think. Um, just as a quick example, when you're talking about the sort of gains you could see in the space of just over a week before Christmas, we saw Ripple go from around 25 cents to above $2.50, so a tenfold increase. If you're using 20 times leverage on that, that's a 200 times gain. So you're having, if you maxed out your account, you'd be 200 times up in the space of just over a week. So it's mm. very, very high leverage, which is why we took the decision to rein it in a little bit and make it a little bit more... Um, Fair enough. Uh, yeah. And if, if actually, if you go to the nuts and bolts of crypto investing talk that I'm doing on the on the KR1 stage later on, 
in the afternoon. Uh, I'll be talking about how I used that kind of leverage on platforms to make very large profits last year off relatively small investments. And I'll be explaining why, because, because I was using platforms that aren't regulated in the UK that allowed you to trade dozens and dozens of cryptocurrencies. Frankly, all those kind of platforms are dodgy. You don't know if they're going to go bust. And if they do go bust, you're not going to get your money back because they're based in whatever country. So I found leverage a very useful tool because it meant I could just put in a relatively small amount of my own money and then borrow large amounts of money from that platform in order to trade big, make big profits. And then I can take those profits out of the platform, which is what I did, and put them in the safety of my bank account back in Britain. So anyway, I'll explain more about that this afternoon if you're interested in, in that kind of uh, crazy trading world, which is a, a world away from the sensible stuff that <laughs> STB encouraged. Anyway, we need to move on to our last speaker who hasn't had a chance yet, Josh Redette. Yes. Uh, and basically, easy crypto. Easy crypto answer, yeah. So we've uh, fastly, very quickly indeed, become one of the UK's largest GPU uh, hardware providers, mining providers in the UK. Um, so we kind of offer a range of products basically from your, your mining rigs. We specialize in the top end, really powerful stuff. So 1080 Ti's, um, which I'm sure some of you in the room might be familiar with. We specialize in the top end mining GPU equipment. Um, we do mining farms, mining rigs, um, and we also do crypto containers. Um, and ship those around the world and take advantage of portable, mobile, renewable sources, hydroelectric, wind, that type of stuff. Um, and, and it's really important for me, when I went into this business, um, just to offer a, a genuine human face. Because the issue is with crypto generally across the board is it's so kind of non-tangible. Um, it was very important for me to have a real sales office in Manchester with real staff where customers can come and see the products, touch the products, get their hands on stuff. Um, and fundamentally, again, with crypto, it's very difficult to have any tangibility. And I've found a lot of people, particularly on the investment side, really love owning physical assets. You know, the equipment itself is, is expensive stuff that, worst case scenario, you could always just flog on eBay. Um, and, and kind of, not that you'd ever have that mentality, but that kind of way of going into things really gives people a great level of security that, that offers, you know, whilst offering fantastic return on investments. Um, you're always secure in actually having that physical product. You know, and our rigs can mine any coin, any time, any place, and we use special software to auto-mine the most profitable coin, totally hands-free, press a button, off you go, and you earn money in your account every day. I mean, I've got to admit, on, on my Facebook page, I was inundated last year with people asking me, uh, about mining. How do I how yeah. do I mine? But they always wanted to mine the main coins, Bitcoin, yeah. Ethereum. Yeah. And you know, so I'd do some research on it. It's not my area, but I wanted to help out. And it just seemed like it was impossible for individuals to make money uh, tr uh, mining the big cryptocurrencies. Um, they never really asked me about the smaller ones, so I never looked into it. But that, that I guess, is where yeah. people can still make money. Well, not even. I mean, it, the, the beautiful thing, well, the beautiful thing for me, at least, and for my company, is that there's so many misconceptions about mining. The first one is, oh, it uses so much power. Well, I, in, in the hall, we're in stand number 53 over on the other side. You can come and see the team. We have a rig with us today. You can come and see it. Um, it's a six-card 1080 Ti rig, six of the world's most powerful mining cards, respectively, on average, for the most algorithms. Um, that's only doing 1,300 watts of power. A hairdryer is 2,000. You know, so it might cost you £3.50 a day, but so what if it's earning you 40, 50 quid a day? You know, so, you know, th there's a lot of kind of things. Obviously, you know, the, the money that it earns is entirely dependent upon the market. We're all averse in that. But we've seen some very, very nice, nice profits indeed over the past couple of months. And there's software out there such as NiceHash, which some of you may be familiar with, that essentially automatically selects your hardware mines the most profitable coin of any coin that exists that's mineable, and then is able to pay you then in Bitcoin. So you don't need 10 wallets and 10 addresses and loads of computer skills. You can have a Windows-based computer that on one side's got Google, the other side you plug it in, you press a button, off it goes, and it can mine. Um, so the name us some, some cryptocurrencies that are worth mining now. So, I mean, obviously in the market that we're at, things change at a ferocious pace, which is why I really like this auto-mine software um, that we provide to our customers, in, in which ultimately, you know, we take advantage of NiceHash and, and work with them, um, because you don't need to constantly check the market and, oh, well, this coin's doing better, we'll swap here, we'll do that, we'll change, because a lot of people aren't that technical. They don't even, you know, 
plugging in their own mining pool and that type of stuff, it can be a bit complicated. Whereas here, you have a Windows-based computer, you press a big green start button, and it pays you in Bitcoin into your account every day. I mean, it's, it's, it's hands-free, which is what we like to offer. And having that human factor where you can call us, hey, Josh, what's going on? We've got a problem. No problem. We'll sort you out. What and, kind and of nice percentage profit can you expect on an investment of, say, £3,000 in your equipment? Well, you know, if you were mining, if you bought it right now and you yep. started mining right now, what kind of percentage per month so, of your so, purchase? Price? Yeah, so we've seen on average over the past four months, again, the numbers are up in the air to some extent, but the last four months have been a pretty good average. We've had really highs and, and good lows. It's a good fair amount. We're looking at between 8 to 15% ROI per month. So, so, you, so most of our customers are maybe property developers, business investors. You know, I've had a couple of property developers who kicked out the tenants and bought 16 rigs, put them in the house and had virtual tenants. Because you can fit, you know, fit 16 rigs in a house, you've got no mortgage, you know, no, no things to worry about. The, no the human factor is, is difficult in those types of things. So, and here you have the asset security. So some of my customers, obviously, those in the know might be aware of the GPU shortages in the world at the moment. I actually had customers buy stuff off me three months ago mine a couple of thousand pounds in crypto, sell their equipment on eBay and made 2,000 pounds on the price we sold it for them to. Okay, but when you said last four months, yes. that's kind of telling because obviously there's been a big change in crypto prices between December yep. and now. So if some, you know, if I bought in in October, yeah, I'm sure I'd be making huge profits per month. But if someone were to buy now, yep. what, I mean, it's hard, as you say, we don't know what the price is going to say. The prices of crypto stayed more or less the same over the yeah. next month. What kind of ROI would about, you expect? So, so we, the company kind of offer, obviously, again, you need to kind of do your research, but we have a kind of three-stage process. So on average, we've seen the rigs, kind of, you have the asset value of the rig, um, and then obviously we're a fully VAT-registered UK <laughs> company, so you're able to get that back. Um, so you're looking at around roughly a 208, 215-day return on investment as what we call a black and white ROI, so money out versus money in. Um, but the, the beauty of GPU rigs, particularly the top-end stuff, the 1080 Ti, um, people always go on about Ethereum mining, and Ethereum's great, you know, I love it as a coin, but actually a 1080 Ti, um, mining Ethereum, depending on the market, can sometimes be as low as the 23rd most profitable coin to mine. Um, there's so much more out there than people care to realize, um, and it's a lot of these misconceptions that people fail to see how profitable it can be. So once you kind of factor in the asset resale of this value, bearing in mind a 1080 Ti is the only card on the market that you can game in 4K, and at the moment, um, you know, if you were to flog it, in a year's time, not that you would, you're going to get a good chunk of that money back. So we bring that ROI down to about 108 days, roughly, um, is what we expect. But of course, as we're all here in crypto, we all believe in its future. You can, you know, mine the coins, hold them. But the beauty of it is, is, you know, as fantastic as the trading options are, which, you know, I do myself and I'm going to be working with these guys, no doubt. There's, there's a definitive advantage in physically owning equipment that is always worth money, irrespective of the crypto industry. Um, and that really offers a stability that some, some people want in this market. Okay, we're going to move on to questions very shortly. We'll have to take five minutes of questions, but that just gives me time to ask one general question to the panel, particularly those of you who've been involved in the crypto scene since the early, early days. Um, we've seen the price of Bitcoin drag the prices of all other, or nearly all other cryptos, down over the past couple of months. Now, obviously, this is nothing new in the crypto scene. There have been big corrections and long drawdowns before. But what I'm interested to know is, those of you who've been in it a long time, does this remind you of the long, the long, long slump of 2014 to 2015, or do you see this as more of a short-term correction? Gilad? Uh, no, it doesn't remind me because we're in a different market with different participants. The market that you're talking about, total market capitalization was between five and $10 billion. We're now, as opposed to this morning, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was 395 billion, 395 billion. Uh, what we've seen and the evolution that we've seen since 14 and 15 is nothing short of outstanding. We now had, back in 14 and 15, Bitcoin, because you've used it as an example, was essentially a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. Now you look at Bitcoin, it's a store of value. It's an institutional asset class. So we've moved on from that. Also, a year ago, when I talked to a lot of my friends that were all working for numerous different hedge funds, and I said, I'm going to focus solely on crypto. We're going to set up a fund. We're going to deploy capital into the space because we believe I was laughed at. A year later, every financial institution in the world is either trading crypto, 
building a blockchain or wants to invest through another company. We've just recently seen Goldman Sachs enter the market via another channel. So no, I don't think we're back there. However, I still think we're super early stages. And when I always talk about this at our, our talks, we're probably 1994, 1995, when we relate back to where we were in the internet days, we're still super early. Yes, it's not as easy as, as dealing, with, with dealing with some of the spread betters with the ease of access. Sure, there is a lot of growing pains that we have with regards to being able to trade. Safe keep, we didn't talk about. Um, uh, it's still difficult as well to, to audit, um, but I don't believe that, that, that you know, we are back in that market. We have grown up in every day that we stay into the crypto space, and today is a great example of it. We're only getting started. It's not going away. Pandora's box has been open, and everyone is now involved. So I think it's, a, it's an amazing, and I'd like to thank Patrick Dooley as well for the Crypto and Currency Investor Show that we're here today. This is, this is an example of the movement that we're currently in. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the, it being more like the early stages of the internet yeah. because, well, I mean, we saw everybody was talking about, like I said, every, every grand was asking about Bitcoin at the end of last year. They yeah. weren't asking about other cryptos. So it kind of reminded me of uh, when yeah. everybody was talking about Amazon uh, or Netscape. The and they, they only knew New a couple of names. Yeah. They didn't know until 1998, 1999 about all the other dot coms that started appearing. We're just getting started. Yeah. 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 We're just getting I think, started. I, I think another point is that when new technologies come, um, you know, hit society, we always use them in a way we're used to do business. For example, I mean, the first five to ten years of the internet, we used uh, directory, right? It was Yahoo, until we understood, no, search is the right way to approach the internet. Mm. And I think what happened 14, 15, as, as Sean said, it was really much more of a commodity market. Okay, it did this high, then it's probably not going to continue to grow, and then fear struck in and everybody pulled out. But now with general purpose blockchains such as Ethereum and a lot of different flavors of general purpose blockchains hitting the scene in 1415 as, as the downturn hit. I think now what people are realizing is that if you find the right protocols, and, and I'm focusing on protocols because kind of the infrastructure of the future, how the internet or how financial industries or insurance or med or whatever, every industry is going to be rewritten on the lowest level of how it, how it um, whether transacts or interacts digitally. And if you understand that, that you really believe we're in, then you really understand we're in a nascent er, um, time of the industry. Because if you find the right protocols and those are building the, indus um, the industries from the ground up, just like the internet didn't work on, on, on TCP IP, right? It was, yeah. uh, on top of that, we had HTTP and then you have JavaScript and then it, it's gonna take us a decade to get to where we are. So. It's very exciting, and I think this is a correction and a very well needed one, I think, as well. Yes. And, and it's going to weed out a lot of the, of, of the scammier project, and I think regulation is, is a good thing. It's just going to, it's just going to be a little less, uh, less hectic as we, as we go ahead, and hopefully it's going to, the climb is going to be more steady and more sustainable. Good stuff. Um, just go ahead, do you want to carry on? I, I should, we're, we're so short of time, we've got yeah, two sure, minutes. Right, Unless you have something. No, I, I was just going to say 14, 14, 15 was obviously the big slump was triggered by Mount Gox, wasn't it? And the large fraud. Yeah. And I think that got a lot of fear and a lot of uh, trust in the place was lost on the back of that. That's so we've not had the same incident this time, which has led to the decline. So I think the environments are obviously different. Yep. Very good point. Let's take a question then from the audience. Who's got a question? There's one in the middle there. Uh, there's someone coming with a microphone for you. This is for the XBT gentleman over there. Yep. In terms of your leverage trading, is there any margin limitations, minimum or maximum? And do they change with volatility? And that's the first question. Okay, sure. Um, it's XTB, not XBT. XTB. So, okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of margin limitations, I think the maximum exposure you can have is uh, £10,000 of your own money, which is leverage five to one for our four smaller markets. And I think it's 25000 for Bitcoin. And what was the second? Did it change with volatility? And does it change with volatility? Uh, no, we haven't changed. Uh, we made that one change when we changed from 20 to one leverage to five to one leverage. But now we've consistent with five to one leverage. Um, and as you enter the trades, that will be the leverage you'll be using. So if the volatility picks up or changes in the short term, um, it won't change. If we do see a huge difference in the market, 
then we may take longer term steps to change that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Another question. We've got one there, just in the aisle seat. Hi. Um, you mentioned about Mount Gox in 2014. Does the panel have any views on whether Tether today is um, strongly founded? And if it isn't, um, it's very easy to pump up uh, cryptos with monopoly money. So if that is proven not to have any um, basis, what's your views? Or, or what's your views on whether there are any kind of well, there dangers we go. in Tether? So could that uh, precipitate a possible meltdown further in uh, crypto prices if it turns out that uh, Tether, which is uh, an instrument that was created in order to kind of monetize certain, certain types of crypto investment. If that turns out to be a house of cards, are we going to see another collapse like the Mt. Gox? Anybody? Um, with regards to Tether, full disclosure, we don't have a holding in it. Um, I understand the uses of it, and I'm always looking to, to hedge, especially on, on down days. Um, I'm very concerned when the auditing team leave a project, as they did in Tether's case, um, it's usually not a very good sign. Um, however, there are some alternatives. Uh, look out for a, a, a very recent ICO, which is doing a stable coin called Haven out of Australia, all-star team. And I think they would, be, they would be a coin that we would use in, in situations for hedging. Um, there is lots of different, different examples. And some, some very good people have broken down why they think Tether um, may not be backed by the US dollar. So I would probably go and do the research on that. Of course, if it turns out that it's not backed against US, USD then, um, of course, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative news-driven, event-driven market. Um, I think it would put the market under some pressure. But um, for me, uh, great idea having a stable coin, but Tether is not something that we hold. Yeah, just for those of you who don't know, the, the idea behind Tether is it's, it's supposed to be uh, backed. Every, every piece of Tether is backed by a US dollar. So there are supposedly billions of dollars, US dollars, somewhere in a bank uh, that all these tethers are based upon, but nobody knows for sure if those dollars really <laughs> exist or not. the auditor. Yeah. <laughs> the auditors, yeah, exactly. Uh, right, we are going to have to wrap up. I'm sorry, I can't take any more questions, which is such a shame, because we could go on like this all day. So thank you to the panelists. Um, one, two, three, four, five of them. Thank you.